Hello to anyone that's tuned in right now. Uh, I've just hit the go live button and now it's like jumping jumping into the deep end. Um, we're, I'm going to use this time to get used to the platform and to get used to speaking. And I'm going to start reading some, some comments that now are flying in. Um, hello to Mark. Hello to Jillian. Allison, oh, this is this is for me something very unusual because I'm so used to dealing with people looking back at me. So I'm going to try to keep my eyes into the camera so it looks like I'm looking at everyone. Please forgive me for any huge mistakes. Hello from Germany. Hello from Philly. Oh my goodness. I've been spending most of the quarantine in Wildwood, New Jersey. Um, Anyone from Philadelphia knows that that's, that's the shore, and that's where you spend as much time as you possibly can. Uh, let's see, who else do we have here? Uh, Anna, Linda, mm, Dorothy. Okay, I think maybe I'm getting the swing of things. Uh, am I looking at you directly? That's my biggest fear, that I keep staring down at my image in the computer or looking down at these little few notes I made. I think I'm going to go without any notes and just ramble. Uh, Nicola, Linda, Jean. My goodness, this is exciting. Vancouver. Oh dear. Buckinghamshire, Finland. Finally, someone from Finland. Yes. Uh, Don. And someone else is a Philly native, Somerville, Mass. I lived in Boston and worked in Boston for years and years. Um, this is wonderful. So I think the plan is that I start talking seriously at 1.30 my time, I guess. Uh, good, good, good. Am I late? No, you're not late, Lucy. Uh, Boston, someone is in Boston. Oh boy, rambling. Yeah, rambling is usually interesting, isn't it? It's so funny when they say say something just to do a test, and you just sort of can't even get any words out. Uh, New Hampshire. Anyone from around Chicago, which is where I am right now. Great to see you. Oh, I keep looking down too much, I think, but I've got to look at the comments. All right. Uh, somebody, an email. Wow. 1.30. Hello. Hello, Jean. Mark, you have a comment that says, say something up there that won't go away. I keep thinking I'm ignoring it, but... I am talking. Yes. Uh, da, 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 Barbara. Edmonton, Canada. Oh. Mark Opera Courses. Sue Ellen. Way back. Wow, I'm looking at all these numbers flashing over the screen. Lisa, thank you for that note. I will look out for the, I lived in Evanston a long time ago. My, Catherine, I spent the weekend with my sister in Evanston uh, just these past two weekends. I hadn't seen her in over a year. Betsy, oh, Betsy Draper in Boston. Oh dear, Barbara.
Jennifer from Nova Scotia. Oh, my goodness. Gibbons, Alberta. I, I worked in Banff for a few summers. It was so beautiful up there. The weather in Chicago, Linda says, hot and muggy. Belgium. Well, now they're coming in so fast I can't even keep up. Um. Hello to Elena or Alina. Hope, sorry if I mispronounce Ivana, Croatia. Oh, this is exciting. Uh, Chicago is not always windy. It, in the summer, it can get pretty hot and pretty uncomfortable. The wind kicks in in the winter, and that's when it's brutal. But, uh, brutal. Brutal. Yes, Banff is lovely. Yes, Banff Center for the Arts. That, that was the place. I did a fall staff there with Colin Graham and Stuart Bedford conducting. Wonderful, wonderful colleagues. Um, bonsoir to Suzanne. I guess it is evening in France. Yes, bonsoir. Dorothy, I'm going to be driving from Bath. Dorothy, Ruth. Oh, Susanna does need an anvil. We we do need we do need a few anvil players. Well, I'm going to get into that in a little bit. But if anyone is uh, an expert on an anvil, we'll we'll need you to definitely sign in. Um, Devin, uh, Donald from Essex, Ruth, Vanessa. There's an anvil sale at Amazon. Oh my goodness. Someone, someone, we were sitting around yesterday, someone was commenting on how if you think of something, you can think up anything imaginable, any any bizarre gadget, you can probably go on Amazon and find one. So I, I guess an anvil isn't that that uh, difficult. Allison says she needs lessons on humming. I have a trick to solve all your humming problems. Not to worry. Uh, let's see. My goodness. <laughs> oh boy, this is this is fun. I've got to I've got to make sure I talk into the camera and not just stare down at comments. This is this is great. Uh, uh, bring me some more. Uh, Rita from Helsinki. Olivia from Lincolnshire, Barbara. Yay for humming hacks, yes. Okay, I'm taking a last swig of water and then I think we're on. See now there are now there are people commenting on hammet on anvils, so we we definitely have to cash in on that and try to work it into the recording of uh, the anvil chorus. Um, so I definitely will talk with Mark and Ben about that. Okay, I think we're coming up on. 130. So I think I'm going to turn this into something more official and start my start my presentation. So I've been chatting for the past 10 minutes or so with all of the wonderful members of the choir. I have to say when Mark called to 
to talk to me about this project. I, I was at first dubious because um, I, I, I'm not technically very savvy as Ben has learned over the past few days. And I really was dubious of how to get this many people, uh, singers, lined up to present something that was uh, good enough to put out in front of the public. And then I started listening to your clips and I was absolutely blown away by the quality. The first thing I listened to was actually the Mahler second, because I thought, oh my goodness, I, I've been involved in Mahler seconds in my career and know how difficult the piece is. And when I listened to the orchestra and then listened to the solo sections and then listened to the chorus, it is just an amazing accomplishment. And of course, I've listened to uh, your Messiah recording, which is just jaw-droppingly accurate, beautiful, expressive. Um, and then I listened to the, uh, the North American choruses that you recorded. And today I pulled up the, the tribute to Prince Philip. And that whole uh, presentation, I, I hope the Queen was able to find the, the time to listen to it because it was extremely moving, and the thought of so many people around the world uh, extending wishes uh, to her through music, and to show that choristers want to be singing now. It's been it's been so long that we can be in a room together, and and I thought that that tribute, the anthem, was just so beautifully sung and so moving. So I am thrilled to be part of this organization, and I hope that our little project to expand into opera is going to be fun for all of you. I don't know how many of you have had any opera chorus experience, um, but but trust me when I say we're going to make it we're going to make it fun and I think it's going to open your eyes to what opera choruses are all about. Um, before we get into into the singing component, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about how I ended up as the chorus master at the Metropolitan Opera. Um, I grew up in a family that was not musical. My aunt, who lived in Philadelphia, I was born in Rochester, New York, which is in upstate New York. I, I had an aunt in Philadelphia, and every time we went to Philadelphia, she would play her opera record. And her favorite opera was La Traviata. And she was the only one in my family that sort of was, was vaguely interested in classical music. Somehow growing up, though, I started listening to recordings. I watched Leonard Bernstein's Young, Con uh, young People's Concerts from the New York Bill uh, when I was growing up. And by the time I was in high school, I was sort of hooked uh, on, on opera, on choral singing, on vocal music in particular. Um, I took piano lessons. I was a horrible student because I had the knack of being able to sight read. And I have to admit, for most of my career uh, career as a student of piano playing, I would not practice much. And I'd just go in and sight read, and the teacher seemed to be pleased with it. So we, we just moved on. I wish I had been more studious, because as my career progressed, my piano skills were always hit and miss. Uh, so I wish I had applied myself better when I was young. But I didn't. In high school, we had, a, we had an, an oratorio society in Rochester that performed about four or five times a year the great choral masterpieces. And somehow I auditioned as a, I must have been 15 or 16 years old, a junior in high school. And I was accepted. The, the director told me, well, you're really too young for this, but but you make a decent enough sound. And if you really love this music, why not? We'll, we'll let you sing with us. So at that age, I was able to perform with the Oratorio Society pieces like The Messiah, of course, Brahms Requiem, Damnation of Faust. We actually sang the Vaughn Williams Sea Symphony while I was in high school with that group with full orchestra. And that experience really hooked me on choral singing. Um, I went to Boston University as a chemistry major, but in Boston there was this chorus called the Chorus Per Musica. And I immediately became great friends with the director who was, whose name was Alfred Nash Patterson. I became the manager of that chorus uh, eventually. 
but um, while I was so-called a so-called student of science at Boston University, I really was devoting most of my interest into into music. Um, we sang with the Boston Symphony quite a bit. I remember performing Berlioz, Romeo and Juliet with Charles Munch conducting the Boston Symphony. We did Beethoven Ninth with Leinsdorf. Uh, and as an, as an organization, Chorus Per Musica, uh, we performed Matthew Passion, uh, many, many Christmas concert performances, a usual, you know, great program for an amateur, excellent amateur chorus in Boston. Um, chorus Per Musica, before my time, actually did the world premiere of the Poulenc Gloria, which I'm sure is a, is a piece that all of you are, are acquainted with with and have heard. Um, it just was a great, a great chorus. And I have to say, I devoted more of my energy to that chorus than to my studies at BU. Um, I, I graduated and went to Europe uh, to sort of experience music in Europe. I ended up in Vienna, where I a summer vacation turned into three years. And I was fortunate to have the opportunity to go to the Staatsoper as a standing room person for like a dollar a day or a night and and stand through upwards of 150 performances each year for three years. And while I was there, I joined the Zingverein, which is one of the great choruses uh, in Vienna, founded in the time of Brahms, uh, certainly with an incredible historical tradition. Herbert von Karien was at one time its music director of the Singverein. And um, he, I, I sang with that group for three years. And that's where I got most of my important education, so to speak. I sang under von Karien. I sang under Scholte. I'm on the recording of the Mahler Eighth with Scholte and the Chicago Symphony on tour in Vienna using Viennese choruses. I recorded Matthew Passion and um, Brahms um, uh, Verdi Requiem with von Karajan. We performed in Salzburg. We performed in Paris. We performed in Berlin. We performed for the Pope. Um, and I have to say that despite the fact that I never really had a conservatory training in my life, I've never really taken a course in conducting or a course in, in theory or a course in anything that you, you spend a lot of time on while you're in a music conservatory. I just absorbed everything I possibly could from, from my exposure to these amazing conductors um, while I was in Europe for three years. I came back, went back to Boston, got a job as a chemist, which is what my degree was in. I actually was working in a laboratory uh, for the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, testing noxious gases coming out of electrical plants smokestacks. And um, I did that job for about four or five months. I had to deal with a lot of acid, uh, titration, chemical work, and was inhaling a lot of fumes. So I was not only destroying my fingers uh, to as far as piano playing goes, but I was inhaling all of this stuff. And after about four months, I realized this job is not going to help me down the road in any way, shape, or form. And I just became a freelance music musician trying to earn whatever money I could. I started out playing in voice studios, which was also one of the greatest things that ever happened to me. Um, the teacher that I worked with actually sang under Toscanini. She sang with Mary Garden at the Chicago Lyric, which is where I am today. I'm, I'm going to hit on the lyric in just a minute. But um, that continued my education. And I got a job at a very small opera company doing everything, preparing the chorus, playing the rehearsals, calling the curtain call. Uh, you know, I did everything and I learned what opera was all about from, from the nuts and bolts up to the performances. Um, the first big thing I was asked to do there was to conduct a Carmen performance when they fired a conductor after the first performance. And the directors of the company said, well, we think you should just conduct the second performance. 
we can't give you a rehearsal. We can't put you on stage. We can't let you do, you know, what you would do in a production. We're going to just throw you in the orchestra pit and you're going to conduct Carmen. I said, well, why not? Uh, I've, I, I've got to, I, I have to keep expanding what I, what I can do. And so I said, yes, the world didn't collapse. I wouldn't say the performance was something I'd ever want to sit down and listen to again. I would probably be, be shocked at all the mistakes I made, but, but I did it. The following year, they asked me to conduct a full performance of Prokofiev Cinderella with ballet. And, you know, here I am again with no con conducting experience, nor orchestral conducting experience, and I knew even less than that about ballet. And again, I said yes, and learned an immense amount from people giving me this chance to try things. In the course of this working with this company, I came in contact with someone who was the nephew of the music director at the Dallas Opera Company, Nicola Rechino. Rashino was a conductor who worked with Kalas. He brought Kalas to the United States um, and was her preferred conductor. So they were doing a performance of Peter Grimes, and the chorus master spoke 10 words of English, and they were a little fearful of having him take over all the choral preparation for Grimes. And uh, so they brought me down to Dallas, and that's where I met my uh, mentor, the man that really, really impressed upon me how important the role of a chorus master is. And I worked as his assistant for about four years, just playing his rehearsals, listening to everything that he said. And um, that was my training. And I feel that I got a training certainly as, as, as thorough and as as uh, as molding as any experience you could get in conservatory, and from there, people met me. They saw my work. I went to the Canadian Opera Company. I went to the Opera Theater of St. Louis. I went to Lyon uh, permanent for a year, where I met John Elliott Gardner, who loved my work. Who brought me to Paris at the Chatelet. We did a huge Berlioz festival with. With, with, with the Damnation of Faust, with the Requiem, with Romeo and Juliet. Um, I then uh, went to the Lyric Opera of Chicago, where I stayed for 16 years with Maestro Bruno Bartoletti. Uh, I left Chicago after 16 years and I went to the Metropolitan Opera, where I've been 15 years the chorus master. Um, certainly over the uh, shut down for the the ice, the pandemic. It's been difficult not having my chorus at the Met, but um, I did a lot of Zoom coaching over the year. I, 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 I've done a lot of work with young singers at Juilliard, young singers at Santa Fe, um, and the young apprentice program here at the Lyric Opera, the Ryan Center, asked me to come back to Chicago and work with their work with their art, young artists. And so I'm in the middle of preparing a scenes program. 10 singers, we can be in a room unmasked. We're performing about 19 different scenes. And um, I'm, getting, I, I'm hearing live music again, back with a company that was my, you know, a huge, a huge part to my life as, as a chorus master. So I wanted to give you just just a, a brief description of, of the things I've done and the bizarre career path I've had. And when I work with young students thinking about getting into the field, I say the most important thing I learned was never to say no. If I had said no to jumping into conducting Carmen, or if I had said no to conducting the, the, Cinder, the Cinderella Ballet, or no to uh, going to Dallas and working with this, this Italian chorus master. I, I think as when you're young, you've got to try to get as many opportunities as possible. And that's sort of how my career took off. Um, there is no one way to become becoming a, a, you know, a musician. And I have, uh, I've, I've reached the top of my field by the most um, bizarre route. So um, I just wanted to fill you in 
this is what you're dealing with. I am not one of these people that is going to talk about, you know, please make sure that the to the dominant chord is this, or let's make sure this 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 seventh really sings out, or can we make sure, you know, make sure that everything lines up perfectly, which I will do. But I don't talk that way. I talk more about the expression and the sound. And now, now I'm going to transition into, into what I think about choral sound. My mentor, Maestro Benaglio, was absolutely the master of coloring choral sound. He worked hand in hand with Herbert von Karajan at the height of von Karajan's career, working on his operatic recordings um, with the various choruses that von Karajan used. He also worked very closely with Carlo Maria Giulini. On a Both of these conductors had this incredible sound, a tone concept, that the sound of a chorus has to be dramatically related to the piece that's being performed. In an opera, the chorus has to have the voice of an operatic singer, has to be a character that is on the same level as the soloist, committed to the text, but also committed to generating a color that matches the orchestral quality at any given moment in the opera, in whatever language we're singing. So, um, he spent a lot of time in blending the sounds. Um, he also talked a lot about the mass of the choral sound. He believed strongly that you needed the maximum mass of sound, which I could relate to a big lump of clay. The bigger the lump of clay, the more you have to mold. And this is kind of a concept that, that I've carried forward in my work with choruses. I like soloists or chorus rap, chor choral singers, to take on the role of a soloist. People say, well, why do you hire, why do you have people with such unique voices? And my answer to that is the more colors we have adding to the mass, adding to this lump of clay, the more we have to mold and the more we have to work with. So I encourage my choristers to really use their voices in a soloistic way and that let me be the warrior about how to mold it into the choral texture. Unless we have sound to play with, we don't have anything to mold. So um, this is kind of how I begin my process. I, I try not to restrict too much what the singer does. I try to listen to the sound as it comes out and then play and mold and push and sort of arrange things. Um, it's, it's, some, people, some people think, well, isn't, isn't this an, an unwieldy way? Isn't it better to start with the accuracy and then let the tone develop? Uh, not for me. I, I, I believe in, in approaching a piece of music from the quality and the expression first, and then lining up the rhythms, lining up the diction. But I think it's really important to start out having this idea of where we want to go with this piece emotionally. Um, what's the difference between choral singing in an oratorio situation and oratorio and choral singing in an operatic situation? First of all, usually opera choruses are performed in theaters that are a lot bigger than the venues where, where oratorio is being performed. So there is this commitment to the intensity of the sound in a way that we need to project it to a large theater. Um, the other thing, of course, with opera singing is that when you're, in, when you're on stage with an opera chorus, you're going to be a mile away from people in your section, possibly. Well, when you think about it, you guys are more than more than the 10 feet or whatever on stage away from your colleagues. And so, uh, you know, it's going to be it's going to be interesting to watch what you do with an operatic line to make it sound soloistic and operatic, knowing that that the blending doesn't happen in a live situation. But on stage in an opera course, you have to be very independent. You have to be in many ways independent of the conductor 
because oftentimes your sight line to the conductor is restricted. You're often staring into a lighting apparatus that is just blinding. And as, the, as we progress technically, I found one of the biggest problems that opera choruses have to overcome is this technology that lighting has taken on in the theater. Many times we are totally blind, especially if you have to enter onto the stage and you have these cross lights. Oftentimes the chorus enters and has to sing immediately after a very short introduction. And unfortunately, sometimes you have no sight to the conductor whatsoever. So we learn tricks of how to deal with not having good connection with the conductor. The other thing that's often a problem is um, positioning on stage. If you're in a large theater, some of the choristers are much further downstage than choristers that are, that are upstage. The distance between the front row of a set of risers and the back row of a set of risers is nothing compared to the distances that we face on stage when we're performing. So that accommodation has to be made. And now we reach the question of staging. Um, some people ask me, how do you cope with difficult stage directors that want conductors, want the soloists to do to do things, chor I'm sorry, that want choristers to do things that make ensemble difficult. And this is where, you know, you learn by experience. And when you get into a position that I am with the years behind me, I now have a, a, a good sense of, okay, I can tell a stage director more than I could when I was a lot younger and a lot less experienced. I can remember things at the beginning of the career that my career that I sort of let happen. And uh, things like a Flying Dutchman chorus, where the men are trying to sing this very different, Steuermann last, die wacht, Steuermann het, this big, heavy, dramatic music, where we need maximum impact into the theater. And I would have stage directors saying, okay, guys, I want you to stamp, stamp this, this, Fear that you're holding, or this this wooden stick that you're holding on the ground, and march in a circle while you're singing this this chorus. And you know, if you think about it, if you're going to march around in a circle while you're singing, for about forty five five percent of the time, you're going to be singing to the back of the back of the theater rather than out to the audience. And so, I would go to a stage director and I'd say, look. We, can't we can't we do something a little different? And I remember specifically one director saying to me, what do you want them to do? Do you want them to stand at the footlights with a music stand and just stare at the conductor and sing to the front of the house? And, you know, in my youth, I was I, I would be sort of, you know, I'm not quite knowing how to how to respond to that. But I think as I've gotten older, I found ways to talk to directors and say, no, I don't want them standing still. But can't we find something that's a little bit more of a com an accommodation to get our sound out to the house? Um, and so every time we go on an, in a new production with a chorus, there are those questions that constantly are, po are popping up. How do you keep the, the chorus dramatically involved scenically, but also dramatically involved musically so that the audience is experiencing this, this incredible effect of this many voices massed together on a stage. I, I'm sure you know, there is nothing more exciting than to hear a large group of singing, singers singing forte, music that is written to be forte. And when you hear it sitting out in the audience, there's, there's almost this physical sense of, of the power of the sound. On the other hand, what I learned from von Karajan, for example, was that there is nothing more thrilling than hearing 120 singers singing pianissimo. There is, you cannot get from a single voice a pianissimo that matches this sort of shimmer that you can get from 120 people singing pianissimo. Foncarian and my teacher were, they cultivated the sound of the chorus singing at piano and pianissimo. And what I do with my chorus is find it, find a way to keep the tone vibrant. A lot of it is related to the vowel and the intensity of the vowel, but somehow take the pressure off the tone so that rather than 
hearing a laser beam of a piano sound, we get this we get this magical shimmer of sound in piano. Now, some of the pieces that we're going to work on next week have great moments of this. Of, of course, the most amazing is the humming chorus, but also the va pensiero to get to get a pianissimo in that music is is our goal, my goal to work with you to find to find that moment where you sense, oh my goodness, this is this 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 music has has lost its grounding in a way. It is just floating above us. And I try to get those kinds of sounds from my opera choruses all the time. You know, the 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 moment that you get in the when when the Alferstein and the Mahler second comes in it, it in, in a performance. There's something tangible almost about the quality of the sound. And so that's what we try to get dramatically in all of our performances uh, as a chorus in opera. The other, the other thing, of course, especially at a place like the Met, is this flexibility in different, in different languages. Um, at the Met, we can have a week where we're singing in French, German, Italian, and then to be totally off the wall, let's say Sanskrit, if we're going to do Satyagraha, or ancient Egyptian, if we're doing Akhenaten, for example, or let's say Russian, if we're doing Boris. Um, so a lot of the training for a chorus, especially at the Met, where we have a lot of music to learn, learn as quickly as possible, is to have a uniform system of 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 pronunciation. I'm sure many of you know of the IPA, International Phonetic, Phonetic Alphabet. And this is what we use as a, as a basis for approaching five or six different languages. I'm sure you've all talked about vowels in the work that you have been doing. Um, for me, uniformity of vowel sound is what allows us to produce the extraordinary range of volume. Unless the vowels of everyone in the chorus lines up, the forte doesn't have that maximum ping and overtone uh, laying on top of, uh, of each other as you're singing. Doesn't have that great uniformity of attack. Same thing in the pianissimo. We have to find vowels that are exactly blended. Um, to create the most magical piano sounds. The other thing in opera, a lot of times we're telling a story. A lot of times we have music that's almost recitative. And so we have to find a way to sing in Italian or to sing in French or Russian conversationally so that every rhythm lines up, but yet it doesn't sound like a rhythm exercise. Um, the great thing about recitative for a soloist is he has that latitude of how how to pace uh, uh, that you have that flexibility. But if a chorus has to sing lines that are recitative, you have to be meticulous in the rhythms, but yet not so meticulous with the rhythms that it sounds like a Kodai music exercise. You have to find a way to sing sing recitative in a specific rhythm so it sounds like a group of 10 people con conversing in the same pace. And that's what we spend a lot of time working on at the in an opera chorus. So um, I'm just sort of setting, preparing you a little bit for the work that we're going to do next week when, when we get into these pieces specifically. Um, I thought I would also just briefly talk about these five pieces if, 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 and give you a couple funny stories maybe dealing with each of them. Uh, the first piece is, is the Brindisi from Traviata. And as, as I said, Traviata was the opera that my aunt listened to all the time. She was my introduction to opera when I was, I think, uh, 16 or 17 years old. No, it could have, I should have been 17 or 18. She actually brought me to the Metropolitan Opera in New York City the last week that the Metropolitan Opera performed in the Old House in Herald Square a building that was destroyed, unfortunately, because the upkeep was just extraordinary. And the city decided they they couldn't keep the building. There was a huge campaign to try to save it, but it wasn't unsuccessful. 
So I went, she took me to a performance of Aida at the Old Met. Supposed to, to, supposed to be sung, Aida was supposed to be sung by Birgit Nilsson, one of the great, great Verdi Wagner sopranos of that, that period. And of course I knew her from recordings. I was so excited to be able to hear, hear Birgit Nilsson. We got to the theater that night and someone came in front of the curtain and said, ladies and gentlemen, this evening, the role of Aida was to be sung by Birgit Nielsen. She is indisposed. And of course, my heart sank, everybody's heart sank. And then he said, this evening's performance will be sung by Leontine Price. And the audience went crazy. Um, so that was, you know, back in those days, you had those kinds of glamorous, exciting singers and I don't think today we could ever have an evening where you set out to hear one of the greatest sopranos in the world. He gets sick and who steps in? Another one of the greatest sopranos in the world singing singing at, at, at that period. But so that was my introduction to the Metropolitan Opera back, back many, many years ago. Uh, Traviata is one of those operas that, that we do all the time. I've been involved with some crazy productions um, a, a wonderful a British designer, Desmond Healy, designed a production here at, in Chicago, one of my first years. And the set was just magical. It sort of shimmered, and you couldn't quite tell what it was made of, looking at it from afar. And they, they hung it for us to see, and it was so beautiful. And then you walked on stage, and it was actually made of these plastic sheets that he had glued plastic spoons onto. Um, and you look at it up close and you say, what is this? And somehow this uh, Desmond Healy had this incredible imagination and knew how to create an image that worked from afar, but didn't pass muster when you came up close. It was an absolutely glorious production uh, there. We did a performance at the Met that involved this incredible red couch uh, that Violetta had to be in this very tight, thin red dress. She was listed on, lifted up on a red couch, and the chorus sort of spun her around uh, on this red couch in, in a skimpy red dress. And I always thought to myself, what would we do today if Joan Sutherland were going to perform uh, Traviata at the Met? We have a production that I don't think we could do with John Sutherland or Mozart Caballé, for example. And this, this is another development that has happened in opera in the past 20 years, let's say, since, since I started out, where productions are getting very specific to, 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 to type of singer, size of singer, I have to say it. Um, and so uh, the, the whole incident at Covent Garden many years ago with someone with with an Ariadne of Naxos, I think it was, where the costume didn't fit the singer. And there's a whole built, big hollow below about this. Back when I was starting an opera, that never would have come up. You, you would have had a great singer singing this role, and then the designer and the director had to work around these singers. Um, I, I certainly would miss, would feel badly if I had never heard Joan Sutherland sing Traviata, which I, which I did several times. Um, so Traviata, we're going to do the drinking chorus. It's a lot of fun. Again, we have to find a way to be accurate, but to sound like we're people drinking at a party. And that, that's another thing. So oftentimes choruses are at parties and they're supposed to be having a lot of fun. The trick is to find a way to make the, the choral writing sound as if people are at a con at a party, not at a concert. So you've got to find a way to loosen things up without without stretching it too much. Much. We'll talk about talk about that a lot when we do the Traviata. Uh, what's next on the program? Oh, the Habanera from Carmen. As I say, Carmen was the first opera I conducted. I've done a lot of Carmens. The current production at the Met of Carmen is by um, Richard Eyre. I know many, many of you know Richard's work. Um, he designed this production that has two turntables. They're concentric circles. And what they do is they revolve sometimes together, sometimes in different directions, and the scenery rotates in and out, the scenes change, and you have this magical transition through Carmen. Well, that sounds great, and it worked many times. 
But as the production started getting older and old, older, the turn this this intricate turntable started to you know swell or contract or shrink, and all of a sudden we kept having problems with the turntables moving. And the last year we did this production, we had one night where the crew could not get the turntable to work at all. So we had to call everyone on stage five minutes before act one and basically restage all of act one. The soldiers in the in their barracks transitioning into the scene with Carmen and the women coming out of the cigarette factory and then the duet with Michaela and then the final scene with the fight of the women. Uh, we basically staged in five minutes the crew actually came on stage during the performance and changed the scenery. And, you know, this is what happens in opera all of the time. Uh, one night at the Met, the transition into the final scene of Meistersinger with 150 people on stage, uh, switching out of the cobbler's scene at the, at the beginning of Act One, where Zox and, and uh, Ava and, and uh, Walter sing this beautiful quintet curtain comes down, there's this beautiful transition music, and at the Met, the curtain goes back up, and you're magically out in the, out in the, in the, in the green uh, uh, city square with, with 150 people in the chorus, and the Meisters making their entrance, and one night, they tried to change the set, and it caught on a curtain, it started ripping apart, uh, the curtain could not go up, and Maestro was in the pit conducting the transition music. The curtain never went up. We didn't know what to do on stage, so we just started singing as loud as we could behind the curtain. And finally, someone had to walk in, in front of the curtain and said, Maestro, we have to stop. We can't, we can't go on. We can't, can't get the set changed. And we took a little intermission in the middle of Act 3 of Meistersinger. But, you know, this is what happens in opera all the time. Um, so Carmen... Uh, we will not have to worry about the turntable. You will not have to move your own furniture. Uh, and we will talk about this, this character of interjections in a solo. The, the habanera is about Carmen, but the chorus can interject a lot of color into, that, into her aria. And she really relies on the chorus to help get her through those two verses of the habanera. Um, the anvil chorus we were talking about before we started, people were mentioning anvils, and you can buy them on, at Amazon. The anvil chorus is uh, certainly one of those choruses that everybody knows. Uh, it, is, it is not difficult musically, I have to say. Where you get in trouble is when you decide that you're going to have anvil players that are not musicians, and they're going to be on stage playing these huge, loud anvils. Um, the production we do now at the Met is actually was actually new at Lyric Opera of Chicago. So I actually did the first performances of this Traviata production here in Chicago, and then it went to New York and actually made its debut at New York it, at the Met, and I went to the Met and did those same productions. What happens in the annual course is that David McVicker, the director, one of my all-time favorite opera directors, um, Ask that we have um, very bulky, you know, muscular bodybuilders, bare chested, sweating, performing on the anvils on stage. Well, you're not going to find too many percussionists in the orchestra that are going to match that physical description. So it was agreed that we would hire supers, extras, who would learn the music, and they would be cast according to body type, not musical ability, and that the music staff would teach them the anvil playing. Well, as you know, when we get to Chi del Chitano i Gio, the, the anvils that are on the beat are not bad, but their anvils off the beat is also, it's Chi, boom, de, boom, Gita, boom, bata, boom. So to get you know, muscle-bound uh, non-musicians to be flexible enough to play the anvils like that was quite a task. And when we did it first in Chicago, Maestro Bruno Bartoletti, who was one of those old-school Italians who was my music director for most of the time here in, in Chicago, just would pull his hair out 
trying to get these guys to line up. And we basically just said, look, it, it may not happen every night. You keep the orchestra going, Maestro. I will keep the chorus going, even if these incredible poundings of the anvils have no rhythm whatsoever, and we will get through it, okay? And every night, that's what happened. We had a couple of performances where it was pretty close, but we also had a couple of performances where it was almost impossible to ignore that pounding so off the beat. And I would look into the television monitor and see poor Maestro, ben uh, Maestro Bartoletti down there, and he just he would just be uh, beside himself that he was conducting something that was so far apart. But, you know, again, again, we deal with this enough. Um, next, we're going to do the humming chorus, which is for when people ask me, what is your favorite operatic chorus? Believe it or not, I say the humming chorus. Um, they they just interviewed me for the New York Times. They did some feature called Five Minutes to Make You Love Operatic Choruses. And they interviewed a lot of people and they, they chose me. And I'm sure they expected me to talk about, I don't know, Aida, Meistersinger, Vapensiero, something like that. And I, I said the humming chorus. Because what what you, what we have to do in the humming chorus is to somehow find a sound that depicts butterflies hope despair longing at that moment at the end of the second act of butterfly maybe depict the night with fireflies in the air uh, we we have to somehow create a mood with the sound of the humming that just absolutely transcends time, transcends space. It's so beautifully written. The chorus is off stage. The orchestra is in the pit with this very light pizzicato. And we somehow have to find a way to sing this melody, to hum this melody that expresses all of these colors. We have to find a hum that isn't pressured. It has to sound like a hum that is constantly rising and expanding. Um, Puccini wrote to have a viola da gamba off stage with the chorus. And I truly believe that that instrument is there only to keep us in pitch. So when I get, ever get a, 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 and sometimes it's played on just a viola, not a viola da gamba. And when I get an orchestra member that usually comes up from the pit at the end of the second act to accompany us, and sometimes at the Met, you never know who's going to come up because the personnel can change every night. I, I always say to them, please don't play this like a viola concerto. We really, I don't feel the audience should hear you. You should just help us to find this magical sound and to be blended into our quality. And I usually put the, the viola player way behind the chorus off stage, and then the chorus, and then me, and then singing onto the stage. So it's always a question of how to get the right color, given the fact that you have to deal with all of these, the distance question, um, and get the right color uh, f for the music. It's not a hard thing to conduct with the conductor. I found that you hear the pizzicato very clearly, usually through, through the loudspeaker. Uh, that's set up, and that I, I and the conductor usually work out our tempo, work out our, our expression. Um, my first butterfly was so long ago that in the theater, we didn't have televisions that you would look at now to see a conductor when you sing from backstage. It really was one of those where they cut a little hole in the scenery, and you position yourself so you can look through the hole down to the conductor in the pit, and then turn to the to the chorus. Today we have we have a speaker, we have a television. Sometimes in offstage conducting, if the delay is particularly tricky to manage, uh, I wear a headset. But I try not to use a headset. I don't like I don't let, like losing the the complete sound of the chorus. So I usually in rehearsal find a way to decipher the beat make the make the correction for the distance and and then find a way to conduct naturally that's a, that's another component of 
how I like to work with cor- with an opera chorus. I want I want choruses to sing naturally. I don't use a lot of tricks. I don't I don't like people having to count and overcount. There are moments that you have to count. But I, I, I want people to be able to perform. I don't use diction tricks. I don't make D's instead of P's or, you know, humming in, on big M's. We don't hum through M's usually. And I try to make it as natural as possible for people to just sing and let it give, let me worry about what the, what the total sound is coming out the audience is hearing. Um, so we're going to have tons of fun with the humming chorus, it being my all-time favorite. And then the last, the last is the Vapensiero, which is, you know, like the second national anthem of, of Italy. Uh, so um, we're going to have to find a way to make that sound heartfelt, um, uh, impulsive, extemporaneous. It, it has to be like a breath of yearning for, for better times, for, for peace, for uh, contentment. It's why it's why sometimes these big Italian funerals that go through the street, you'll just hear the the, the onlookers break out into into Vapensero singing unison. Um, it's an it's an anthem, but it's also uh, it's also a yearning. It's not it, there's when you when you're asking for your thoughts to be sent out over 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 the air. Vapensero sulari dor over over wings of gold, let my thoughts go back to my homeland. Um, it has to sound spontaneous. It has to sound natural. And that's why, you know, the question with Vapen Sierra is, oh, well, you always encore it in a performance. Believe it or not, as much as I love to highlight my work and the work of the chorus, I am not a big fan of encoring Vapen Sierra because it's so hard to create that first initial freshness of performing it. I I always, I, I pace a lot backstage when the chorus sings. And when I listen to Valpensiero song by the chorus, I'm waiting at every moment for all of those expressive yet spontaneous lifts that come out. And when, when I'm content in that first run through, and I feel it's, I feel the freshness of singing it that first time, I'm just so happy to let that memory be there. Please move on. Don't make us try to cre- recreate a moment that's going to be, you know, everybody wants it to be better. Well, don't we want the first one to be to be that that expression in the course of an opera? So, uh, unfortunately, today, um, even at the Met, where encores are supposedly forbidden, it's sort of accepted that we do it, and uh, you know. We do it, and usually it's it's pretty good. But for me, in the context of the opera, the, when when the curtain goes up for that scene, and the chorus is is sort of they 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 get spun around on a turntable, and then they're just ex- revealed in their positions, and and then that melody starts. It's very hard to recreate that moment. So you know, there we are. Um, I I hope I've I I hope I've you know, communicated to you how passionately I feel about opera chorus work. Um, so many times people have asked me to conduct, and I don't want to conduct. I really don't. I don't know enough about the orchestra, and so I. But I know enough about singing, and I and I'm so committed to to choral sound that this is this is what I've given my my life to, and I hope I hope we can share some of that. That excitement that I have about about this music, which from I know for many of you is going to be something brand new. I'm probably going to ask you to do things you've never done before with your voice, and we're we're gonna we're gonna get there though, and and I think you're gonna find it is so so much fun. Okay, I'm gonna look. I'm gonna now try to glance at at the comments and see if there's anything I really should comment on. This is so hard for me to. Do uh, let's see. Um, I'm just getting thanks. Anybody throw a question out at me? Anybody have a question before I go back to my rehearsal? Uh, oh yes. Oh, it's the, the amazing chorus right after Rothman's here. Every chorus in Nabucco is amazing. The opening scene is, you know, is about a ten-minute 
beautiful with different sections. There's a beautiful harp section with the women singing this lofty melody across the harps. Um, any chorus in Nabucco is just so exciting. Um, da, 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 da. Thanks, thanks. Thank you. I, I, I am so excited to, to launch out this project. Um, uh, the score, you have your scores. Next week, we're going to, next week, we're going to, we're going to get into each piece. I, I promise you. Um, thank you so much. Everybody's saying thank you. I guess, I guess everybody seems happy by all this and looking forward to it. If you want to reach me by any chance, you can reach anybody at the Metropolitan Opera. I'm not telling a big secret here. D. Palumbo, one word, at metopera.org. You can always contact me that way. Um, right now, the Met, we're going full steam ahead for opening in the fall, which is so exciting for, for all of us. So um, um, I, I hope I hope some many of you have seen our, our uh, HD broadcast that we've kept going throughout this entire uh, year and a half, but boy, we're we're just we can't wait to get back to in in person performances. We're doing a Verdi Requiem on September 11th, which should be incredibly moving. Uh, it's the 20th 20th anniversary uh, of September 11th attack, and uh, we're hoping that the, it's going to be a televised live performance, um, and that will be our first official event. And then we open the house with an opera, a new opera. Fire Shut Up in My Bones, uh, fascinating story, beautiful music. And then the second night we do Boris Gudinov. So we are, we are coming back in full force. So uh, we're, we're all thrilled. I'm just trying to look at some more. more. Okay. Um, I think, I think I'm going to sign off here because they're probably wondering what happened to me upstairs. So I can't thank you all enough for listening to me. I hope I haven't rambled too much. Uh, I, this is how I, 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 I'm not, I don't take a scientific approach to anything I do. Everything is just spontaneous and um, what I feel. And this is something so important to me. I thank Mark and Ben for bringing me onto this project. I can't wait to see you all next week. Okay. Have a great week and I'll see you soon. Bye.